the endocrine system. The endocrine system's main function is for communication, communication from one part of the body to another part of the body. Endocrine glands produce chemicals that travel throughout the bloodstream to affect cells at other locations in the body and mainly are used for homeostasis and to regulate body processes. There are two systems in our body that are designed for controlling bodily functions. One is the nervous system and second is the endocrine system. The nervous system, as you recall, is made up of neurons which produces electrochemical responses from nerves and neurons that produce quick responses from specific muscles or glands. They use neurotransmitters, nerve impulses, and synapses to, to carry their, convey their information. The response times are very fast and very short term. The endocrine system, on the other hand, is a bit different. It involves glands they produce chemicals called hormones that are released into the bloodstream. These hormones control metabolic activities of cells, simultaneous cells throughout the body. The responses of the endocrine system messengers are slower, but they may have a long-lasting effect. Hormones travel to, through the blood till they reach a specific target cell. I can review the endocrine versus exocrine glands. Exocrine glands are glands that secrete their product into a duct. This is an example of this would be sweat glands, salivary glands, sebaceous glands. Endocrine glands are ductless glands. They secrete their secretions not into a duct but into the uh, interstitial fluid which is picked up in the circulatory system and, and goes directly to the blood. Once it's in the blood, it, it travels throughout the blood vessels to reach a specific target organ. There are three, trig three triggers of stimulus uh, in the endocrine system. One is humoral stimuli, second is neural stimuli, and next is hormonal stimuli. Humoral stimuli is, is when hormones are released in response to changing blood levels of certain ions or nutrients. For example, if the calcium level of the blood is high, then it triggers certain certain hormones to be released to try to restore the balance of the calcium. This could be said for many different ions and, and different uh, particles in the blood level. Neural stimuli is when a nerve fiber causes a hormone release. You see this in the, in the case of the pituitary gland. The pituitary is controlled by the hypothalamus, which causes nerves in the hypothalamus to causes the pituitary to release its hormone. And hormonal stimuli are when a hormone is released in response to other hormones that are produced by other endocrine glands. It's also seen in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus produces many hormones that affect other endocrine glands to produce hormones. As an example, the uh, pituitary gland releases thyroid releasing hormone, which stimulates the thyroid to produce thyroid hormone. This cartoon depicts the three different types of stimulation, the humoral stimulus, neural stimulus, and hormonal stimulus. This is a review of negative feedback system for homeostatic control. We've covered this in chapter one in anatomy one. The negative feedback system is the most used feedback system in the body. If the amount of hormone is too low, the glands produce more hormone. If the amount of hormones too high, the gland produces less hormone. That's the basics of negative feedback. The endocrine system compi comprises of three different components. There's the endocrine gland itself, the hormones that are released, and then the target cells. It's important to know that the target cell can only respond to a hormone if they have a receptor for that hormone. Hormones don't affect any cell. And only, oh, hormones only affect the cells that have a receptor for that hormone. Hormones produce effects by entering the target cell and then either increasing or decreasing normal cellular function. For example, it can, the hormone can be involved in opening or closing an ion channel, synthesizing enzymes or other proteins, or introducing or inducing a secretory activity.
Hormones come in two basic flavors. There's amino acid hormones and steroid-based hormones. First, we look at the amino acid-based hormones. These are amino acids. They can either be amino acids, they can be short chains of amino acids called peptides, or long complex chains of amino acids, which are proteins. These are water soluble, means they dissolve in water. Water. And since they dissolve in water, they cannot cross the plasma membrane, which is waterproof. These are the second messenger system. So the hormone itself acts as the first messenger. It acts on the receptors of the plasma membrane of the target cell. This hormone then interacts with intracellular proteins, which is the second messenger to change the cellular function. So the second messenger system involves the hormone interacting with the, tar with the rece receptor of the cell. It internalizes it into the cell and then affects an internal cellular process. Steroid hormones are all synthesized from cholesterol. And these are lipid soluble. That means they, they dissolve in lipid or fat. And since the plasma membrane is made of a bilipid, uh, bilipid layer, these can cross into the, they, these can cross the plasma membrane. As opposed to amino acid hormones, could not cross the plasma membrane because they were water soluble. These are the steroid hormones are lipid soluble. They can cross the plasma membrane and, and easily can go into the cell. The receptor hormone complex enters the nucleus of the cell, binds to specific regions of DNA to promote metabolic activity and promote synthesis or structural proteins or proteins to export from cells. So basically, the steroid hormones go inside the nucleus and affect the DNA to produce proteins or other cellular functions from a direct influence on the DNA. Here are locations of the endocrine glands. Note where the pineal gland is, the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, the thyroid gland, the parathyroid gland, the thymus, the adrenal glands, the pancreas, and the gonads. And we'll look at each of these glands later on in this lecture. First, I'll look at the pituitary gland. Remember, the hypothalamus reduces, releases hormones into the pituitary gland that regulate the secretion of hormones from the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is located in, is protected by the cella turca, which is a part of the sphenoid bone in the skull, one of the cranial bones. The pituitary gland is about the size and shape of a pea. It has a stalk connected to the hypothalamus. That stalk is called the infundibulum. And the pituitary gland has two major lobes: there's a posterior pituitary and anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary is composed of glandular tissue. It's like a, think of it as a gland. And there are six, six hormones that are produced by the anterior pituitary: there's a growth hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, and prolactin. Posterior pituitary is composed of neural tissue. So think of it maybe think of it more like a, a bundle of nerves. And there are two hormones that, that is released by the posterior pituitary, pituitary the oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. We'll look at the hormones first all produced by the anterior pituitary. First is the growth hormone. Growth hormone is produced by the anterior pituitary gland. It's stimulated by growth hormone releasing hormone which is, comes from the hypothalamus. Growth hormone causes a somatic growth or, or growth of the body parts, mobilizes fat, and spares glucose. Growth hormone is, is what's responsible for making you grow. This is an example of too much growth, growth hormone and too little growth hormone. The person in the middle is a, a giant, uh, has gigantism due to uh, overabundance of growth hormone. This is Seen often in a case of a pituitary tumor that secretes growth hormone excessively, and then the gentleman on the f on the left of the picture is a pituitary dwarfism, which he, he is his pituitary does not secrete enough growth, horm growth hormone. The lady on the right is a normal size, normal height adult. There's a thyroid stimulating hormone. It is also produced by the anterior pituitary gland. It's stimulated by the thyrotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus, and it stimulates the thyroid gland to release thyroid hormones. This 
diagram on the right here shows that the hypothalamus secretes the thyroid releasing hormone. Or excuse, probably releases the thyroid hypothalamus releases the thyrotropin releasing hormone, which causes the anterior pituitary gland to release the thyroid stimulating hormone, which causes the thyroid gland to stimulate stimulates the thyroid gland and causes it to produce thyroid hormones. The negative feedback comes in with the thyroid hormones can negatively feedback either anterior pituitary to reduce its production of TSH or it can influence the hypothalamus to reduce its production of TRH. Adrenal corticotropin hormone, ACTH, is also produced by the anterior pituitary gland. It's stimulated by corticotropin releasing hormone. CRH that is coming from the hypothalamus. See, there's a pattern here that most of these hormones from the anterior gland are stimulated by a hormone from the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is ultimately kind of the, the boss man that's, 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 that's controlling the hormone release. So, so the hypothalamus releases CR, CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus, and it causes the pituitary gland to release ACTH. And this causes then in the adrenal glands to release corticotropins, cor causes the adrenal gland to release glucocorticoids and androgens. Those are the hormones produced by the adrenal glands. Follicle stimulating hormone is produced by the anterior pituitary gland and is stimulated by gonadotropin releasing hormone, GnRH, from the hypothalamus. In females, FSH stimulates ovarian follicle maturation and the production of estrogen. In males, it stimulates sperm production. Luteinizing hormone is another sex hormone that's produced by the, by the anterior pituitary gland. It's stimulated also by the gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. In females, LH, or luteinizing hormone, triggers ovulation and stimulates the ovarian production of estrogen. In males, it stimulates testosterone production. Prolactin is produced by the anterior pituitary gland. It's stimulated by a decrease in prolactin inhibiting hormone from breastfeeding. It's inhibited by dopamine. In females, prolactin pr promotes milk production from the breast. Antidiuretic hormone is produced by the, the posterior pituitary gland. And this, this is produced from the neural portion of the pituitary gland. It's stimulated by decreased blood volume and low blood pressure. It stimulates the kidneys to reabsorb more water from the urine. So in the diagram here, it causes the kidneys to reabsorb more water, which then actually increases the blood volume and increases the blood pressure. And no, it's noted triggered by a low blood volume or low blood pressure, it triggers the ADH production. And then its effect of the ADH is to have the kidneys to reverse that process to increase the blood volume and increase the blood pressure. It's a negative feedback system at work. Talk a little bit about antidiuretic hormone. First of all, what is a diuretic? A diuretic is something that promotes the formation of urine by the kidney. A diuretic causes a person to lose water because they lose water through the urine. Uh, many things that act as a diuretic. There's coffee, tea, alcoholic beverages can act as a diuretic. There are drugs that are diuretic. Um, Often diuretics are used to treat edema or high blood pressure by increasing the urine output. When you take a diuretic drug, it causes the urine output to increase, therefore you're losing more fluid through the urine system. ADH is inhibited by alcohol, which means less water is reabsorbed and therefore more is excreted. That's why you urinate more after you consume alcohol. The antidiuretic hormone has the opposite effect of a diuretic. Antidiuretic hormone causes the kidney to transfer water from the urine back to the blood, which works in the edema or works in the high blood pressure. Oxytocin is the other hormone produced by the posterior pituitary gland. It's stimulated by stretching the wall of the uterus and by breastfeeding. It stimulates the uterine contractions, it initiates labor, and it initiates milk production. Now we look at a different gland altogether, the thyroid gland. Remember the thyroid gland when we said that in the human torso back in chapter 1? It's a butterfly-shaped gland located in the anterior neck. 
anterior to the trachea and inferior to the larynx. Thyroid hormone is the body's major metabolic hormone. Thyroid hormone is made by the follicular cells and secreted by thyroid follicles. Calcitonin is also produced by the uh, thyroid gland. It is released by the parafollicular cells and it lowers blood calcium concentration. See in the diagram here the follicular cells are these follicles filled with colloid and in parafollicular or around the follicle are these cells in the, in the between the follicles. This is another picture of the thyroid hormone control. We saw this earlier, how the hypothalamus releases a thyrotropin releasing hormone, which causes the anterior pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone, which causes the thyroid to release the thyroid hormones. And see the note the negative feedback inhibition of each of the thyroid hormones has on the effect of the anterior pituitary and also on the hypothalamus. This helps regulate so there's not, not an overproduction of the thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone promotes, promotes normal oxygen use and metabolic rate. It is needed for normal development of the nervous system, muscular development, skeletal growth and maturation. It's needed for normal function of the heart, normal GI motility and normal hydration of the skin. A goiter can occur from either hyposecretion or hyposecretion of thyroid hormone. Here's a picture of a young boy with a goiter, or a, which is a swollen thyroid gland. Now, there's a condition called Graves' disease, which produce, is, comes about from the overproduction of thyroid hormone in the body. And its main symptom is this exophthalmus, which the eyeballs appear to be protruding. This is due to the accumulation of fat behind the eyeballs that cause the eyeballs to protrude giving sort of a bug-eyed appearance. The parathyroid glands are four glands that are hidden from view. They're in near the posterior thyroid glands. The parathyroid glands are the most important hormone for controlling blood calcium level. If you have blo low blood calcium, it's detected by the, the parathyroid gland. Again, this would be a humoral type of uh, trigger. It causes increased parathyroid gland to be released from the parathyroid gland. This increased parathyroid hormone causes several things. Number one, it causes increased osteoclast activity in bone. Remember, osteoclasts consume bone, so this can breaks down the bone and releases calcium into the bloodstream. So this is one way it raises up the calcium level in the bloodstream. It also increases the calcium reabsorption in the kidney tubules, so it increases the reabsorption of calcium, therefore adding more calcium to the bloodstream. And it, it increases activates uh, vitamin D by the kidney. The vitamin D is used by the body to absorb more calcium from the small intestines from food we eat. So these this parathyroid hormone affects the calcium blood level in three different ways. It releases, it affects more calcium to be released from the bone stores, more calcium is reabsorbed from the kidneys, and more calcium is reabsorbed from the GI tract through the use of vitamin D by the kidney. All, threes have, all three of these have the effect of increasing the calcium level in the blood. The adrenal glands, you might consider them as two different glands in one. The adrenal, the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla. This is a cartoon of the different cells, different areas of the uh, adrenal cortex and medulla. The adrenal cortex is divided into this, these three areas here, the zona glomerulosa, the zona fasciculata, and the zona reticularis. And the adrenal medulla is, 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 is deeper further down. Each of these zones produces particular hormones. Aldosterone is produced in the upper layer of the zona glomerulosa. Cortisol and androgens are produced in the zona fasciculata and the zona reticularis. And the adrenal medulla produces epinephrine and norepinephrine. This is some 
Microsoft s slide showing the different zones of the adrenal gland. The adrenal cortex makes many hormones collectively called corticosteroids. They have long-term effects. There's mineral, cortico mineral corticoids which regulate the electrolyte concentrations in extracellular fluids. The, the hormone that typify typifies this mineral corticoid is aldosterone. Glucocorticoids help us resist stress. Examples of this are cortisol, cortisone, hydrocortisone, corticosterone, and then the gonadocorticoids are weak androgens which are later converted into more potent hormones such as testosterone or estrogen. Gonadocorticoids are produced in the zone of reticularis region. The mineral corticoids, again, that, that regulates electrolyte concentrations in the extracellular fluid. Aldosterone is the most potent mineral corticoid. It simulates absorption of sodium. It simulates the reabsorption of sodium from the kidney tubules. And this, uh, in, uh, when sodium is reabsorbed, then the water follows the sodium and has a rehydration of the, uh, of the blood vessels by taking water from the, the, that would be normally excreted from the urine. And it's triggered by decreasing blood volume and decreasing blood pressure and by rising blood levels of, of potassium. So when the blood volume is decreased, it's going to trigger the aldosterone to be released and that aldosterone has the effect of resorbing more water which helps to offset the decrease in blood volume and the decrease in, decrease in blood pressure. Again, it's a negative feedback system. The adrenal glands produce uh, catecholamines, norepinephrine or epinephrine. These are the fight or flight. We, we cover this in the in the autonomic nervous system, the fight or flight or sympathetic nervous system. Adrenal medulla produces the same type of norepinephrine and epinephrine hormones. The pancreas is a, is a gland that has both exocrine and endocrine functions. The endocrine gland part produces two hormones, insulin and glucagon. Insulin is a hypoglycemic hormone. Hypo meaning low and glycemic means sugar. So high insulin produces low blood sugar. Glucagon is hyperglycemic, which means it raises the blood sugar. The exocrine part of the fat pancreas produces enzymes that help digest uh, f your food and fat that, that you eat. And the exocrine glands, you know, are, are glands that secrete their hormone in a tube. So these tubes go into the uh, not to the skin, but go into the GI tract. There's a microscopic picture of the pancreas with the eyelets of Langer hands, which produces the, uh, the insulin. What is insulin? Insulin effectively lowers blood glucose levels. It enhances the membrane transport of glucose into fat in the muscle cells and inhibits the breakdown of glycogen to glucose and inhibits the synthesis of glucose. So basically the bottom line of insulin is going to lower blood glucose levels. The opposite is true for glucagon. It increases blood glucose levels. The main consequence of, of having too low blood sugars is a condition called diabetes mellitus. There's type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus. Type 1 is due to hyposecretion of insulin, or in type 2 is a result of hypoactivity of insulin. Some of the effects of diabetes blood, cause blood, blood glucose levels remain high, causes nausea and high blood glucose levels. Glycosuria is when glucose is spilled out into the urine. Glucose in the blood is filtered into the kidneys and therefore is excreted through the urine. Since glucose can't get into the cells without insulin, the cells start using fats for cellular fluid, cellular, cellular fuel.
three main cardinal signs of diabetes are polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphasia. And with this, polyuria means basically urinating a lot. Polydipsia means excessive thirst. Polyphasia means excessive food and hunger, consum food consumption and hunger. Gonads are the ovaries and testes. The ovaries produce estrogen and progesterone in females. Testes produce testosterone in males. And this slide is just reminding that there are other endocrine producing, there are other hormone producing structures in the body, such as adipose tissue, the heart, the kidneys, liver. We're not really going to cover these in this lecture, but just know that these are the, there are other organs that produce various hormones.